Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Linley. So Linley introduced me. I'm Yubi Shabaych. I'm the CEO of Tenstorrent. And I'm here today to tell you a little bit about the company and much more about what we've been doing in the last couple of years and the beliefs that have been driving that. So I'll get right into it. So Tenstorrent was founded in 2016, so a little bit over four years now, uh, on the premise that there's a lot, uh, a lot of demand for computation brewing in the field of machine learning and that the way of addressing it is not necessarily just filling as many teraops and terabytes per second as you can in a chip. Uh, that is just as important to have a general and flexible architecture and one that can be extremely scalable and one that is able to do things that uh, make execution of, of machine learning uh, a little bit more intelligent than just ramming through all the math. Since then, we've been working on three chips. Two of them we, we produced and got back in our labs. One of them we're taping out fairly soon. So the first was a test chip called Drawbridge, kind of a small incarnation of our architecture, Global Foundries 14. The second was Grayskull, which is the part that I'll primarily focus on today. So we got back in our labs about three months ago. It's a much bigger chip. It's a data center oriented uh, uh, product that it's going into. And then finally, Wormhole, which is a uh, an even bigger chip, which is again for data center, but oriented more towards training. So with that, a few slides about, uh, you know, the guiding principles behind our architecture. So to begin with, just a quick overview of what we're really copying here. So in nature, you've got, um, you know, big and little training and interference supported, uh, really extreme efficiency, everything built around the same baseline architecture. and some of the trends in the computer world have been markedly moving away from, from this sort of philosophy and introducing lots of boundaries between small and big and training and inference and edge and data center. Uh, there's another kind of spectrum that's, that's kind of formed up in, in artificial solutions that, that are built uh, in imitation of, of natural neural nets. So on the, on the left side of this slide, you have a kind of what's, what's emerged is the dominant way of, of approaching this problem. And it's big machines that run big matrices in dense math hardware. So whether it be SIMD or even denser than that, that communicate generally speaking over ethernet as, as they scale out. So these are pretty efficient in terms of hardware. You get a lot of tear offs, you know, per watt per, per millimeter area. On the flip side, you've got spiking neural nets, which essentially from a computer architect standpoint, there are many core, many core scalar computers. Every one of them has the ability to do conditional execution, so it has branching. They communicate single numbers across, across essentially networks. So they're not very efficient from a purely sort of tops per watt and uh, terabytes per second per, per resource spent uh, you know, standpoint, but they do have this very nice feature that they can implement functionality where if something is not stimulating a neuron, the neuron is just not gonna do anything and that yields very good power efficiency. So I wanted to, to sort of marry the concept of conditional execution with some of the more popular workloads running on the dense machines. And, and uh, the first one is, is BERT. And uh, the first most obvious way that this can manifest is, uh, you know, BERT consumes text. Uh, text shows up in non-uniform sets. So usually you'll get uh, some number of words or sentences. Uh, they're not fixed. All of our architectures today essentially aim to process it in a, in a fixed manner. So one way that conditional could present is that you, you only process what shows up and you don't need to do padding to get the, the fixed dimensions that, that were assumed, which the majority of today's architecture need to do. So this is a thing that we certainly wanted to do. Another example on top of BERT, and I, I did a few of these that uh, that are based on BERT with really no change for the model architecture purely to show that this kind of approach is relevant to today's workloads. So this is early exit. Uh, the idea where instead of running uh, uh, an input through the whole network, you cut in early and check whether you have the right answer and you're sure that it's to, to a high degree of certainty that it's right. And if you do, you just stop executing. So this is again something that you can do with barely any change. So it's, it's basically an incremental addition to BERT. It's not a change. So to, to, to ground this in, in the kind of results that you can get from it, uh, here are some numbers that we're actually getting. So the, the first number here is running BERT base on squad 1.1 in floating point 16 numbers. 
just run the network same as everybody else does it. What we're getting nowadays is, is 28, 30 sentences per second, which is a good number in of itself. I think, uh, in fact, a, a very good number for the power envelope that we're in. But then we start uh, basically applying dynamic sequence length and early exit, which I, which I showed before. And uh, we get a much better number, which is the middle number on this slide. Finally, with judicious application, again, choosing at runtime where to apply lower precision than 16-bit, than instead of doing it uh, ahead of time, you get an even much bigger number. So with no change to BERT, the promise of this approach is pretty solid. But I'll make the argument that is, as you actually open up the model or design a new model, you really go from being able to, to be 10 times better into the territory where you can be 100 times better. And uh, you know, an, an approach that embodies that is here where you go into a BERT encoder and you do runtime head gating based on what's in the input. So this is kind of details of the model. I'll leave discussion of it to, to later in the panel or the breakout sessions. Another thing that was driving us is that there was, from the get-go, it was obvious that models are, are growing very quickly. And uh, in the last year, it's been even more so than in the years leading up to it. So I show here the progression from BERT to Turing NLG. We went from a half a gig to, to like 34 gigabytes of, of half or B faults. There are models on the horizon that credible teams are working on. They're not science projects. They're in excess of a terabyte. Which leads to this question of uh, how big do we need, basically, uh, to, to build this computer to, to be that's a good, good solution for machine learning? We believe the answer is it needs to be as, as big as we can really shoot for. So summarizing this intro section, we need to keep the hardware efficiency. We need to be good at, at uh, tops per watt and, and uh, bandwidth per resource assigned to, to getting it. We need to get conditional efficiency, we believe, which we've, as an industry, been mostly ignoring so far. Storage efficiency, to me, this means that models are huge. Cost per bit storage is a really big deal. So one needs to keep that in mind as an architect. Finally, we need to be shooting for huge scales, so 100,000 uh, chips, uh, even more if possible. And all this needs to be tied together by software that works. So a pretty tall order. So how do we do this? Well, A, computation needs to be factored into small blocks so that you can put if statements around. So in our case, the answer was 16 by 4, 16 by 16 groups and numbers. You need to be good at control flow on these so you can't be suffering from you know, dropouts and efficiency as, as you are putting if statements around them. This in a sense means, uh, you know, no more big jams, no batching, at least not in the traditional sense, although it's, it's not a 100% a uh, hard statement. And then a lot of software has to move from ahead of time to runtime. In order to enable a 100K node computer, uh, again, to, to different people, this, this means a different thing, but to me, it means no shared memory space. So no huge machine, no, no easy shared memory space abstraction, certainly no coherency. Really, the only way you do this is with a grid, of course, that you connect via network. But the network's huge here, and you really care about the paths that data takes, which means network needs integration with compute. You can't be going through top or X switches that, that are going to do who knows what to your data flows. So ultimately to us, it's chips that implement compute, networking, both the interface and the switching, as well as exposing the full control of, of that networking to the, to the graph compiler. So popping in one level, what, what this yielded for us is essentially a machine that works on packets natively. So on this slide, I show the progression of a tensor that begins as, a, you know, as this blob of numbers at the top left. It gets packetized, uh, you know, broken up into small pieces with framing gets attached. Everything is packets from then on. Everything we do work on, everything we move, all of our processors you could view as packet processors. Many chips is the same thing as a single chip except the bandwidth clip on the edges of the chip that compiler needs to comprehend. Zooming into one of these cores, it's actually got something like a it's, it's programmable in the architecture, but in the chips that we brought out, it's a megabyte of, of banked SRAM per core. Packets arrive in that SRAM. A hardware unpacketizer unpacketizes and decompresses them. They turn into tensors. Tensors get computed on. 
eventually you want to send intermediate results onwards, you repacketize, recompress, put it in SRAM, and it automatically gets forwarded according to some spec where it needs to go. At a structural level, our core is, uh, looks like this. So it's five risk cores. They're fairly good in order single issue risk cores. And they share uh, a three terawatt compute engine, which has a dense math matrix and convolution mode, as well as a, a, a CMD mode akin to a GPU. And then there's this packet processing engine that does the compress, decompress, and packetize, unpacketize. All the cores run C++, they arbitrate for the expensive resources, similar to what, what a GPU does. We also have a, a, a NOC that we designed internally that essentially is a custom double 2D torus. Uh, in grayscale, this yields 384 gigabytes per second per of I.O. per core. We put in really extremely good multicast uh, features compared to anything that we've seen or found before. Uh, and we put in a lot of hardware offload for, for data movement management. As I said, everything is done at packet level, so we almost for free get efficiency with DRAM, efficiency with, with I.O., with virtual memory lookups. All this put together, we got Grayskull. We got it back uh, late December. It's, it's a pretty efficient, pretty fast machine learning processor. Uh, we're trying to, to productize it first on a 75 watt PCI Express card, so the chip's TDP is being set to to 65 watts and all the numbers I talk about here are, are with that TDP in mind. So I'll spend a few slides talking about our software. So as much as every processor that, um, that we have on the chip is, uh, is really a C++ programmable, you know, sequential machine in a sense, the entire thing is targeted as a spatial architecture. So more akin to a CGRA or, or an FPGA. So I show, uh, an analogy here to how FPGA compilation works where, you know, you have lookup tables, you specialize them to gates, you connect them with switch boxes and you get your circuit. For us, we specialize a core to do a convolution operation on tensors. We connect multiple cores across the NOx that we have in the chip. And essentially it's a, it's a, it's a spatial compilation type thought process. In order to break the links between chip size and, and the model size and to enable further sort of optimization space opening, uh, we add the dimension of time to how the software handles the compile task. So here I show an example where there's a graph or that's a neural net, uh, uh, basically set of layers, let's say. Uh, there's an example shown with the green layer where we can schedule it onto 16 cores, four cores, a single core. If it goes in 16, it runs a short amount of time. There's the Z dimension of these cubes. If it goes on core, on four cores, it runs longer, on one core, even longer. So the thought process of compiling for this mach machine can be simplified down to thinking of the process of generation of these space-time cubes and then aligning them in a way that uses the machine most fully and yields all of them completing at roughly the same time. So I wanted to show some of the flexibility that the architecture together with the software stack uh, afford. And uh, to do this, I, I show a couple of different parallelizations of ResNet 50 that, that we built. So the first one was built for, uh, for basically a, a batch one low latency implementation of ResNet 50. And what we've done there is we've done a, a software pipeline approach to parallelizing the, the workload across Grayscale. So this image here shows uh, five pipe stages. Each one of them runs a portion of the network. Uh, once it's done computing its portion of the network, it basically throws the output over to the next stage of the pipeline. One thing that I want to highlight here is that in this image, I'm showing ResNet 50 uh, parallelized across five pipe stages, but uh, we can actually split the chip up this way or all the way to the granularity of a single core uh, and have it run different workloads. And the reason we have that dual 2D knock is that one of them runs in, in one direction, the other one runs in the opposite direction. That kind of gives us the ability to keep traffic related to a set of cores and to the tasks they've been given purely local to them. So we have the ability to separate off, let's say six cores, tie a DRAM channel to them alone, and basically have them be living almost independently of the rest of the cores and working on, on stuff on their own. Uh, without having to worry about any data pollution on the network uh, that basically is uh, is resulting from 
workloads that are unrelated to your, your given task. So the trip fully supports multi-tenancy. These multi-trip solutions that we'll be bringing out in the future do as well. So this is the second example of ResNet 50 where we parallelized it essentially in a more batch-like fashion. So in this example, each row of 12 cores runs a copy of ResNet 50. Each row will do a batch of two and then weights are being broadcast to the lot of them from DRM essentially. So this yields a higher throughput uh, implementation, but uh, obviously higher latency implementation as well. So between these two slides, I wanted to give you a sense for the fact that the architecture supports a lot of flexibility as to how you, you bring it to bear on a problem, uh, which differs from, from many that are out there, which really come with, with a very hard preference for a particular way of, of realizing. So a high level view of our software stack, this is uh, somewhat uh, similar to everybody else's. Uh, we plug into PyTorch and Onyx right now. We've actually plugged into other frameworks as well, but these are getting the most, most attention from us at this point. There's a front end uh, kind of ahead of time compiler. It has a front end, it has a couple of optimization stages and a back end. Uh, we have a fairly non-trivial runtime engine that runs in firmware on all of our cores. It provides a lot of the runtime adaptation that the machine is unique for. And then finally, all of this runs on our, on our bare metal hardware. Uh, one, uh, one more thing to kind of highlight is that in the software stack, we've basically implemented the ability to uh, dump out multiple levels of representation as the graph is processed through the compiler and then provide the ability to cut in manually and to sort of optimize pieces of, of what was produced there. So the idea here was that you get both the automatic flow as well as, as uh, nice hooks for manual optimization that you probably want in order to eke out every last you know, ounce of performance out of the machine. So with that, um, I'll conclude. I mean, uh, with conditional execution, we aim to break the link between model size and compute demand. So models are gonna keep growing. We don't want to keep growing the computers in a directly proportional sense. We, we went after tight integration of networking and computing as, start, as tight as we've ever seen really before from the get-go in order to enable massive scale-outs. The flexibility of our architecture enables running training, inference, other big throughput data-centric workloads, full pipelines essentially on our architecture without having to be exiting onto other types of machines to, to stitch up the pipeline. All of this together we hope is gonna unlock the next generation of machine learning and data processing solutions. Thank you, Linda.